me begin by saying that you cannot always trust your feelings. Amen. You see, feelings have nothing to do with the facts of God's Word. That's right. So often I hear Christians that read the Word of God and they say, but, but pastor, that's not my reality. I, I know what the Word of God says, but it's not my reality. And, and, and instead of believing the Word of God, they look at their circumstances and their situations and they say, that must be the truth and that can't be the truth because they don't match. But let us begin to understand that our feelings are elusive. Feelings have nothing to do with the facts of God's Word. Feelings come and feelings go. And feelings can betray you. Feelings can fool you. So today, I want to suggest to you, the title of my sermon is, God is Closer Than You Think. You may have trouble reading that. Some of them may be a little blurry. You need to put your glasses on or something. But God is closer than you think. So today, I want us to trust the facts and not our feelings. The Apostle Paul, we're told in the book of Acts, uh, was in Athens. And, and he came upon these men who were worshiping uh, a statue to the unknown God and he had this conversation with them and we're going to kind of pick it up in the middle of that conversation. It's the book of Acts chapter 17 verses 24 to 28 and we're just going to kind of get to the to the heart of, of what he said there. Um, <coughs> this is it right here. It says the God who made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places. That they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. This is the verse I want you to get. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we are indeed his offspring. Amen. The Apostle Paul was confronting folks who were sincerely seeking God and wanting to know who God was and and we know that in the city of Athens there were these statues to all kinds of gods. But right in the middle of this, of this uh, place there, there, there was this statue that was made to the unknown god. And, and the Apostle Paul took the opportunity as he stood before that statue to tell them, you can know God. And you can draw close to God. Listen, this is more than a step-by-step -step process. This is something that happens supernaturally. But there are some things that you and I can do to draw closer to God. The Bible tells us in that verse that God is closer than you think. He is not far away. And so what can we do to draw closer to God? Well, I'm going to offer you five questions. That if you, depending on how you answer them, they might bring you closer to God. They might draw you closer to God. So these five questions to bring you closer to God. The first one of these is, are you a Christian? Now, that seems like it's so elementary that, that I almost want to say, duh. But, but the reality is, is that there are a lot of people who call themselves Christians, who think they are Christians, who are going to stand before God one day, and he's going to say, and you are exactly because I've never heard of you before, because I don't know your name. In fact, the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 7, tells us this. These are, are Jesus' very words. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, and then he gives us this very tragic 
uh, dialogue here. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I believe this is one of the most difficult verses in the Bible to read. Because what it says is there are a lot of people that have been deceived into thinking that simply because they prayed a prayer or they filled out a card or they attended church that they're a Christian. Let me tell you this. You've heard me say it before if you've been here more than a few days. That going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Chicken nugget. It doesn't make you a chicken nugget by going to McDonald's either. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Reciting scripture doesn't make you a Christian. There's only one thing that can cause you to become a Christian. Only one thing that can cause you to become a child of God. And that is that you confess that your need for a Savior is greater than anything that you can do to save yourselves. The reality is, is that none of us can save ourselves. Romans 3.23 is a verse that we're very familiar with. And it says this, simply that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. To fall short of the glory of God means that you don't meet the standard. Amen. Now you say, well, pastor, what is the standard to get to heaven? Are you ready for this? Perfection. Amen. <laughs> you got to be perfect. Now, does that include you? On your own, are you perfect? No, sir. The Bible says that if you say you have not sinned, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you. All have sinned. That means all. The word all means everybody. In the army, we say la di da -di everybody. Okay? And what that simply means is there's no one excluded from this fact. We all have sinned. And because we've sinned, we've fallen short of the glory of God. The picture there is a picture of someone shooting an arrow at a bullseye target. Not only do they not hit the center of the target, which would be a perfect shot, they don't even hit the target. They fall short. We explained this to the children this week at Vacation Bible School, that because of sin in our lives, how many, sin does, how many sins does it take to be less than perfect? Do it on one finger. That's right. It only takes one sin. Now, how many of you have committed more than one sin? Raise your hand. Come on. Come on. Get real. Okay? Because of that, you're not perfect and I'm not perfect. Now, this isn't good news for us because we've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. This next verse, the first half of it, doesn't make it any better because this next verse, Romans 6, 23, says the wages of sin is death. That means that what you have earned and you deserve to get. That's what a wage is. If, you're, if, you, you know, if you receive a paycheck, that's your wage. That's what you've earned and you deserve to get. Now, if, if because of we've all sinned, we've all, uh, we've all failed to meet the standard of perfection, then the wages of sin is death. And you say, well, pastor, that just makes sense. Everybody that lives dies. You know, it's not a trick question. What is the death rate of humans? 100%. It's 100%. I don't know of anybody that's, that's defeated death permanently except for one, and that person was perfect to begin with. Amen. The reality is, is that we all will die eventually. So you say, well, that just, that's logical. That makes sense. We all sin. Because of sin, we, we all die. But the word that's used there for death is not the word that means your heart stops beating, your lungs start breathing, stop breathing air, your brainwave activity ceases. The word that's, just, that's, that's translated as death in that verse is the word that means total and complete separation from God and anything that is good. Because all things that are good come from the hand of God. That means that forever, forever, you will be totally and completely cut off from anything that's good. The Bible uh, uses lots of imagery to describe this, but basically what this means is that if you get what you deserve, and we all deserve it, we're going to die and go to hell. That's our reality. That is mankind's reality. So when I say to you, are you a Christian? 
Can you answer that question in the affirmative? Well, the only way you can answer that is by the second half of Romans 6.23. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what the second half of Romans 6.23 says. In other words, what we get if we get what we deserve is to die and go to hell. But God says there's something else that you need to know. Can you put that verse back up there, brother? Romans 6.23. The free gift of God is eternal life. We talked about what a wage is, something we earn and deserve to get. Let's talk about what a gift is. Is a gift something we earn? Is a gift something we deserve necessarily? No, it's something that we get from somebody who loves us and wants us to give us the gift. It has nothing to do with our qualifications for the gift. It's simply something that somebody wants to give us. And, and they want to give it to us, and we don't have to pay for it. We don't reach for our wallet, and somebody gives us a gift. We don't say, well, that's awesome. Thank you. Here, let me give you the money for that. That would, try, that would kind of defeat the purpose of a gift. That would call, we would call that a purchase. We don't purchase, our, we don't purchase gifts. Our gifts are given to us freely by God. And God wants us to have eternal life. But you know what? When you buy a gift for somebody, you don't just go into Walmart and say, boy, that diamond ring there in the, in the jewelry counter, that looks really nice and reach in there and grab it and walk out the door, do you? Because the security people will be on you like white on rice. Okay? You've got to pay for that diamond ring or whatever else the gift might happen to be that you want to give to somebody else. You, somebody has to pay the price for that gift. And the price is the very last part of that verse. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus had to pay the price for you and me to receive the free gift. And so then it comes down to whether or not you want to accept this gift. Because a gift isn't yours until you accept it. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He wants you to have the gift. He's already paid the price for the gift. The gift has got your name on it. He wants you to have it. His desire is for you to take it. He doesn't want you to pay him for it. He wants you to receive it. John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible, in my estimation, says, For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave, he didn't sell, he didn't exchange, he didn't barter, he gave his one and only son, and, and, and whoever believes in him, in other words, what do you believe? You believe that Christ paid the price that you and I deserve to pay. Amen. If you believe in him, you will not perish, but have life everlasting. So the question, the first question is, are you a Christian? The answer to that can be yes, only if you say, because I have confessed my sin, I've repented of my sin, I've turned from my sin, and I've turned towards God, and I've asked Jesus to forgive my sin and to be my Savior and Lord. And if you can declare that, then you can answer that first question in the affirmative. Are you a Christian? If you are, then you need to know that if you're a Christian, then you are a child of God. Amen. If you're a Christian, then you are a child of God. You want to be close to God? You've got to first become in a relationship with God. And that's what it takes to be a Christian, a child of God. And guess what? Here's, the, here's another neat perk of receiving forgiveness of sin and, and the gift of eternal life with, with God forever in heaven. And that is that he comes and dwells in you, in the presence, in the person, rather, of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you become then empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's what we've been talking about for the last two and a half months. Okay? And so, and so then you can say, well, how close is God? Well, how close is your heart? How close is your liver? <laughs> because the Holy Spirit lives within you just like your, your vital organs live within you. You are never separated from God because the presence of God and the, and the person of the Holy Spirit resides within you. So the first question to do you want to be close to God and, and the question is then are you a Christian? The second 
question that I would ask you if you want to be closer to God is, do you read your Bible? Again, this is almost like a no-brainer. This is like Christianity 101. And yet there are so many Christians that say, I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't have any idea. I, I'm, I'm walking around all the time and I just don't know what God wants me to do. I, I never hear from God. And, uh, and, and, and I just, uh, you know, I, I know I hear people that say that God speaks to them all the time and I don't understand it. And they're walking around with their very heavy Bible, but they never crack the cover. Because if you want to hear what God has to say to you, you've got to read his word. Because he's already written it down. Whatever the question that you have, God has given you the answer in his word. No matter what the question is, no matter what it is, God has already promised us that in his word. Do you read your Bible? 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 17 says this. And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says this. All scripture is breathed out by God. Okay, when somebody speaks to you, do they breathe in or breathe out when they speak? They breathe wow. out, don't they? Nobody can, can speak and breathe in at the same time, I don't think. Uh, maybe you can, maybe you're special, maybe you're different, but I, I don't think it's possible. So it's breathed out by God, and because of that, then it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So the Word of God is there. Do you want to, get, you want to come closer to God? Then you need to read the Word of God. You need, to, you need to consume the Word of God. You need to hide it in your heart so that whenever you need a word from God, you don't have to go to, the, to, the, uh, to Google search and look it up. You can simply know where to find it in His Word because you've begun to consume the Word of God. You've made it a part of who you are. If you want to draw close to God, start reading His Word because that's how He speaks to you. But any good conversation requires not one way, but two way communication, doesn't it? And so my third point is, is do you pray? Because reading God's word is the way that we hear from God and hear what he has to say to us. But, but praying is the way that we speak to God, letting him hear our heart. And we had a whole Bible study this morning on prayer and, and all of that. But, but I want you to know that God shapes the world through prayer. This is a quote. Uh, from John Bunyan. I love it. It says, God shapes the world by prayer. I'm sorry. This is by E.M. Bounds. The more prayer there is in the world, the better the world will be. The mightier the forces against evil. And John Bunyan said, prayer will make a man cease from sin, or sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. William Law wrote this, he who has learned to pray has learned the greatest secret of a holy and happy life. You want to you draw closer to God, you want to enter into an intimate relationship with God, then you've got to read his word and you've got to spend time with him in prayer. Letting him hear your heart and, 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 and letting him know the, the, the deepest uh, thoughts that you have. You've got to be real with God. You know, so many times we hear people preach uh, preach that prayer somehow is this, this ethereal kind of thing that, that is out there somewhere and that you've got to go to school and you've got to have a theology degree to be able to pray. But if you can open your mouth and utter words, then you can pray. And guess what? If you can't utter words, <laughs> then just groan. The Bible says that if you just groan, God knows what your heart is saying. Teach. And so you can, you can let God know what's on your heart and mind. Listen, he's already, he already knows what's in your heart and in your mind, but he likes to hear his children speak it. He likes to hear his children ask for the things that they want, and he, just like the parents do. Parents want to give their children good things, but, but they like to hear the children's voices when they, when they ask for it. And so the third point is that we need to, the question is, do you pray? And it's a simple thing, and yet it's so profound. It's so profoundly simple. Number four, this one, this one kind of steps on our toes a little bit because, well, let's just read it. Number four, are you obedient? See, this is where, this is where the rub comes because, you know, we, we, we read God's word, we pray to God, 
But then when God tells us to do something, we say, well, wait a minute, God, you know, I, I'm not feeling called to that. I, I don't feel called to do that, you know. And, and God didn't ask you whether you felt called to do it. If he said to do it, guess what? You need to do it. Parents, when you tell your kids to do something, do you need a five or ten minute discussion about it? The answer to that is no. If you tell your kids to do something, then you want them to do what? To obey. You want them to be obedient. And why do you want them to be obedient? Because you know better than they do what they need to do. Come on. Come on. Are, am I right? You know better than they do what they need to do. And they may think they know everything. You know, there is a, there is a certain age uh, period when kids know everything and parents are dumb. But I will tell you now, having kids that have grown out of that age, for the most part, um, all of them, but one, and she's almost out of it, okay? <laughs> okay? Um, she's, she, if she's listening, I don't think she's listening. But anyway, um, the point is, is that, is that the older you get, your kids get, rather, the older your kids get, the smarter you become. Because my son, who didn't want to hear anything that I said, who in fact said to me these words, frankly, Dad, it's none of your business. <laughs> He said that. Am I telling you the truth? I'm talking about you, son. Okay? Okay? He, fr he said, frankly, Dad, it's none of your business when I offered my advice on something. Later on, he's calling me on the phone saying, Dad, what do I do? What do I do? Because he got a little older and now he understands that maybe he doesn't know everything. Well, look, if you as a parent can give advice to your children and tell them what they need to do because you know better than they what they need to do, then how much more our Heavenly Father can tell us what we need to do because He knows far better than we do what we need. Romans 1, 18-25 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, and they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, here we go, here it is right here, folks. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. <laughs> and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals or bank accounts and cars and clothes and, yeah, yeah. and, uh, and technology. Uh, that's, uh, that's a paraphrase. Okay? Verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity to the dishonoring of their body among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Are you obedient is the next question. If you don't feel close to God, listen, when your kids have done something wrong, do they run up to you and jump in your arms? No, they go hide in the closet. Okay? They go hide. They don't want to be anywhere near you because they don't want to know what you're going to do. And so they run away from you. If you want to be close to God, then you need to become obedient to what God has told you to do. It's a very simple thing. You want to be close to the Father, you've got to obey the Father. You want to be close to the Mother, you've got to obey the Mother. You want to be close to God, you've got to obey what God has said in His Word. The Bible is not golden corral. Look, man, we went there, we went, some of the men went there yesterday, and there was a lot of food out there, and I didn't eat every bit of it. Honestly, I didn't. Okay? There were certain things that I picked out on the buffet that I really liked, and I put those on my plate and I consumed those. Okay? Maybe a little more than I should have. But the point is, is there were some things that I didn't that I that I didn't even touch. I didn't even go near. You know? And that's okay if it's golden corral, but, but we don't get to choose what we're gonna obey and not obey when it comes to the word of God. It's not a buffet. It is not a buffet, folks. We've got, to, we've got to obey the whole truth. 
And we've got to know the truth if we're going to obey it. You know, I'm the worst. I'm the worst when it comes to reading the instructions. I don't need no stinking instructions when I put stuff together, and I've had to pay the price for that on numerous occasions. I'm not going to go into any more detail about that. If you want to know some details, see my wife afterwards. She'll be glad to tell you that sometimes after you've done the very best that you can, then perhaps you need to open the instructions and read it. And, you know, that's the story of a lot of our lives. We try to do it on our own thinking that we know best. And then it gets into a mess. Amen. I didn't mean to rhyme, but that did rhyme. And, and, and so then we turn to God and we say, God, I need you to get me out of this mess. And he said, did you read my instructions? <laughs> Well, you know, I just, God, no, I, no, I didn't. Well, let's go back to the beginning. Step one. Here it is. Genesis 1-1 in the beginning, God. Okay? And we need to read his instructions so that we can follow his instructions. Amen. We've got to be obedient. Are you obedient? You want to be close to God? You've got to be obedient. You've got to be obedient. The last thing, and again, it's not an exhaustive list, but I think it's, it's, uh, I think it's very important. Number five is, are you serving God? It's very closely related to number four because God has called each one of us to do certain things in the kingdom of God. And if you're not serving God, then you're not being obedient to God. You're missing number four and number five. That's right. Too often we say, well, you know, I don't have the talent to teach a Bible study class or my home is not nice enough to have a Bible study there. I don't cook well enough to help with meals on wheels. You know, I'm a businessman, not a carpenter. I wouldn't know the first thing about building a house for Habitat for Humanity. But you see, when we step out on, in faith and offer all that we have, God will use us in powerful ways. Amen. But we've got to be serving Him. Jane Douglas White wrote this. It says, how much is enough? Just what we have when God is with us. Scripture says in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So even if you feel like your faith is fading, if you need to know that God remains faithful toward you. His commitment to you never changes. Philippians 1.6 this is a promise that I love. In Philippians 1, 6, it says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So you see, we don't base our faith on our feelings. We base our faith on God's sovereignty, what he has done in our lives and what he is doing in our lives rather than on our feelings. Listen, think about those times when you've been on fire for God. What were you doing during those times that gave you joy? You probably were reading your Bible. You were probably spending time in prayer. You were probably hanging out with other Christians, going to Bible studies, telling others about your faith, serving God. These are the things that we need to do, not in order to be saved, but because we are saved. Because we are children of God, we need to be about the work of our Father. Amen. I love the story of Jesus when he was a boy. We don't hear a whole lot about Jesus when he was a boy. There's a couple of things at the beginning, his birth, and, and when he was dedicated, and then we pick up again in Jesus' life. Uh, when he's uh, gone to Jerusalem for the feast, and uh, they, they're making their way back afterwards, and uh, after a couple of days' journey, uh, no CPS around, uh, uh, the parents notice their son's not with them. You know, today, you know, suddenly on 911, calling uh, child protective services, but they, they kind of did what everybody does when they lost something. They kind of retraced their steps, and they come and they find Jesus sitting in the middle of the temple teaching the rabbis. You gotta get this picture. This is an amazing picture. It's a foreshadowing of what, what Jesus Christ is gonna do in his adult life. And the parents go up to him, kind of ticked off a little bit, you know, as parents would be, as you would be, if your child was missing for three days and you had, didn't notice it, you would blame your child. Okay? Just saying, okay? 
And you would say, what were you doing? I can, I can almost hear his voice. Mother, father, you know that I'm going to be about my father's business. This is why the Bible says that Mary hid all these things in her heart, because there was just no fathoming some of the stuff that Jesus did. Because Mary knew the father that Jesus was talking about wasn't Joseph the carpenter. The father that, that Jesus talked about was his heavenly father. He was going to be busy doing the things of the father, being about the father's business. And yes, Jesus is our example on how we should live. But we don't always, we don't always throw back to when he was 11 or 12 years old in the temple. But the truth is, is that we all, each and every one of us, need to be about our Father's business. That's what we've been called to do. If you want to draw close to God, be about the Father's business. I guarantee you, when you're running the Father's business, he's going to check in on you and make sure you're doing it right. He's not going to leave it to you and just trust that you're going to do it. He's going to check on you on a regular basis. He's going to make sure that you're crossing the T's and dotting the I's and all of that. <coughs> These are the kind of things that you need to do regularly and consistently. And as you do, I think you'll experience fewer and fewer roller coaster rides. And that fire that you once had when you were a brand new Christian will burn stronger in your life, stronger than ever. And you will feel the presence of God in your life. God is closer than you think. With one voice.